Okay, everybody, the buzz continues on this year's be a thon for and more. And, of course, we're, it's brought to you by the Insect News Network. And, and uh, as we talk about on the show quite often, the world of insects and people who understand and appreciate them is a global topic. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you look like, what your background is, what your religion is, if you studied, what your money is, you can appreciate insects. And as I further, the further I go through life, I see people that not only are bringing the uh, human-insect connection into a brilliant perspective, Perspective with their work, but they're passing it on to the next generation as well. And I'm delighted to have on the Beathon and the Insect News Network for the first time. This is Lewis and Beatrice Chikai, and they are specialists in food production and um, uh, residential pest control. But I'll let them tell you more about that. So, Lewis, welcome to the Insect News Network. It's a pleasure, Be Beatrice. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. So much. Yes, and and so let's start off with food supply. So, first of all, we were talking about agricultural pests, and you have a, a very special perspective on one that has uh, it's been a headliner now in the United States uh, really a top headliner the brown marmorated stink bug tell me about why this creature is so important well first of all it's, uh, I think the importance is uh, from various uh, perspectives but mostly because it's an invasive pest it came here and left all the natural enemies and you know that kept it under control mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. its uh, home of origin in Asia so it comes here and it's roaming free mm -hmm. and it's expanding its range and uh, we had a direct uh, taste of it this past summer oh uh, uh, is that right with with the uh, cowpea crop is that with right the cowpea crop but and, and we've always had it uh, you know what would think is an important host plant uh, and monitored it, and, and in fact, uh, we, we have uh, been rearing it. I, I, it turns out that we, we've been able to raid on a continuous basis in our lab, and that's the first time that oh, it's been raid to uh, the fifth, sixth generation, and, and, and we, we're going to uh, make sure that is published. But, uh, and, and that's you know, quite significant. Sure, sure. What, when you can write you it, understand you, it, you can yes. understand it better. And what? Is, what? Uh, I think it's birds that keep it in check back in Asia. Isn't that the correct? Is that? Uh, no, it, it, it it's got a, a wide range of uh, uh, parasitoids, and I think birds maybe, but mostly parasitoids. Uh, birds maybe some of the per, uh, per, predators that keep it in check. But I, I haven't read much about birds. Uh, but. I think it's mostly the parasite. The, the little tiny wasps right. that do so much work and so much benefit for humans that we never, most people never see a parasitoid wasp, but they keep a lot of these pests in check. So what does the next 12 to 24 months look like in the, in the fight against the spread of this uh, invasive species? Well, you know, I tell you, US uh, DA is doing ex uh, excellent work uh, trying to develop different strategies to maintain, it, including, uh, you know, screening pesticides mm -hmm, that would mm -hmm. kind of look at biological control agents, both the uh, native ones and, and, and important uh, species that have been brought in. And there's a lot of public education with this one too, right? Because it's being shipped around on consumer goods as well, right? It, it, it can be, and, and it probably is, but, you know, uh, people get to, to know that it's present when the you know, weather gets cold and it moves indoors. And oh, it's it, one of those. Okay, it, so it's it multivoltine. It can live throughout the season, throughout the year. Yeah, but but I think more importantly, is what it does to to crops, uh, mm. to fruit crops, uh, vegetable crops, and it's expanding its its host range and uh, just the spread in, in the U.S. I think now it's in what 41 states. Yeah, it really it's really yeah. close. To everything but Alaska and Hawaii at some point. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's gone. And, and uh, what it did to our cowpea crop was just uh, incredible. Uh, it came in droves, and it was an outbreak. And we were unable to harvest. Anything. Wow, a completely devastated completely crop. Completely devastated. That and was it, the it's, first time that, that any such report has been made. And it's difficult sometimes to advocate on behalf of insects because they can be such a potent force in nature and in agriculture and in human affairs. And that's what I'm going to talk about with Beatrice now for just a moment. And before this is all done, I want to circle back around about Cameroon because that's where you're both originally from. We've got to talk about the bugs in Cameroon. So we'll take a quick pause. We'll be back part two with the Jakai family.
so we were talking about crop pests, and now we're going to talk about residential complica- <laughs> complexities. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Perhaps Beatrice happens to be an expert on and what, by in my uh, humble estimation, is the most misunderstood creature on the planet. It's the cockroach. So, Beatrice, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about your work with cockroaches. Well, I work with the German cockroach, and uh, a lot of people don't want to say they have it. Yeah. Why? Because <laughs> of the stigma that is attached to roaches. Oh, yes. So controlling it is a problem because people don't want to accept the fact that they have Isn't an infestation. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so All the social implications, <laughs> yes. the embarrassment of having a German cockroach in yes. your house. Yeah. So what we are trying to do is to let the population, let people know that if you have cockroaches in your homes, there are other alternatives to the use of pesticides. I see. There Excellent. are other ways you can co- control cockroaches other than using chemicals because the first thing they do is they spray with I chemicals. See. Yes. And when you think about the pesticide, the residues, you go to homes, there are little children crawling on the floor, the residues, they, they crawl on the floor, yeah, pets, yeah, they have pets, pets yeah. they mm-hmm. put their fingers in their mouth. Mm-hmm. The, the tendency is that, or report has been shown that those residues have implica- if effects on, the, on their development. Absolutely. So people should be aware that spraying is not an, the last option. There and are other and it doesn't even work that well. Yeah. Cockroaches come back, right? And then they develop resistance yes, to the yeah. pesticides. And over time, you keep using it, it doesn't work. Yeah. And you are wondering what is happening. Yeah. So when you keep, when it doesn't work, what do you do? You keep spraying frequently and at higher dose. Big treadmill, absolutely. Yes. And, and so. now we're talking about, this is the first interview we've done this weekend about integrated pest management. Those three letters, folks, IPM, might be the biggest three letters uh, besides the INN, which is the Insect News Network. The, <laughs> I, <laughs> the IPM, the biggest three letters in the future of human insect connections, at least as far as food production goes and disease control. So two, two specific questions to anybody out there listening. What is the best technique of IPM with a cockroach that doesn't involve the chemicals? Okay, the first thing I will tell you is don't allow them in the first place to get into your home. Okay, so, so what mechanical do do? and, and, and seal uh, all the physical holes. barriers. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. all those barriers, seal all your holes, and uh, you know you have actually eliminated that possibility yes. of that getting them in. Yes. If they are in, sanitation is the second ah, major. Clean your homes, folks. Clean That's your <laughs> homes. Put food in jars. In containers. Sweep the behind the refrigerator. <laughs> That's a big one, right? That's yes. where most people get them, you know? So yeah. those are the two major. Okay. Now let's talk about the appreciation. So as a researcher, what can you say about cockroaches as far as their... What, what amazes you most about them? Um, they are very intelligent. Very intelligent. Yes. yes. So they were highly look intelligent. Very creatures. intelligent. Yeah. They are smarter than we think they are. <laughs> yes. And more sensitive too, right? Very sensitive. They, they communicate with each other with their antenna. Yes. And, and I mind you, folks, this goes back hundreds of millions of years. It's the same structure, the same body design. Our fossil record of cockroaches goes back so far. They know. They got to figure it out. We have to adapt to them more than they have to adapt to us. So, so before we bring on the next generation of, of the family, tell me about Cameroon. Uh, is there a special insect? I mean, many countries around the world have, have an insect that has a, a spiritual significance or a cultural significance. You know, sometimes it's the butterfly, sometimes it's a spider. In Cameroon, is there, is there an insect that has a, is it the, the Jablovac? Um, the the, I, the, the I, ants, I the Jablovac ants? No, I think in Cameroon, a lot of the significance with insects is for food. For food. People use, there's a certain period when we have termites and, um, um, and grasshoppers. Yes. There's some particular species mm-hmm. which they eat in Cameroon. Yes. Oh, and I see, yes, the entomophagy. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah, that's so the, the word. So that's, that's what it is. So, so the, yes. it's, a, it's a very common practice. It's a common and, and, practice yeah. where they eat those. In, in uh, certain parts, I have to add. It, certainly, it's certainly. Not, it's not very it, widespread, but it does exist, mm-hmm. and, and, and folks enjoy it. It's a delicious thing. I've enjoyed it myself. I think they're delicious <laughs> when they're cooked. Roasted termites yeah. or, or, or crickets or, or grubs, sure. you know, from palms. Palm sure. Yeah. Uh, so they, they have their share of uh, yeah. entomophagy uh, yeah. and... and well, there was a fantastic um, Nova special, a PBS television special called the Javlavac, the, the, the Cousins of Cameroon. And it <laughs> featured this one particular section of Cameroon. I think it was in the, the mountainous regions of mm-hmm. Cameroon, mm-hmm. Where, where this one particular group of people um, have this relationship with the driver ants. And when their crops are being threatened by the native ants, they'll bring in these big vases, these jars of mm-hmm. these driver ants, and, and, and pray to them and do ceremonies and talk to them like they're brothers. 
brothers, and then they release them into the fields, and the driver ants work the field, and they clear up. <laughs> right in the middle of my story. <laughs> so we'll be back for part three from Cameroon and elsewhere. <laughs> Stay tuned. Part three here with the Jakai family, and this is Stanley, and this is Leonard. Gentlemen, welcome to the Insect News Network. Hi. Hi, uh, nice to see you, Stanley. Hi. It all started with him because of this fantastic headgear. <laughs> and uh, now you guys are here at your first big conference. Is this your first conference? Yeah. Okay, it's mine too here. My big first ESA conference. So let's start off with the Big Brother. So um, do you have a, a favorite insect in the world? Mm, I like... I guess I like the yellow jacket. Yellow jacket, good answer. That's one of my favorites as well. The Vespa, yeah. Now the Vespa is a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty irascible, pretty uh, uh, grumpy kind of insect. She can be kind of aggressive and sting people too. But there's a really uh, an interesting life cycle behind them too. Huh? Why do you like the yellow jacket so much? Uh, because it's fast and uh, I like the colors yellow, black and yellow. And sometimes like it also it also protects. It's like babies and stuff because... Do you hear that, folks? It protects the babies. And what does it protect it against? Like, sometimes humans, if mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. a wasp nest or something. Yeah. And it also protects against, like, the predators that try to eat it or Absolutely, something. Absolutely, yeah. And also, the yellow jackets and those type of aggressive wasps, they can be kind of difficult to deal with, but they are the major protectors of your rose garden, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the plants where big caterpillars like to chew the leaves and the flowers and things like that, all day long, the yellow jackets are flying around and they're picking off those caterpillars. They fly back and feed them to their young. So that's a great answer, too. So let's go to the man I first met here. So what's your favorite insect? Um... Spider? Yeah, you said that. That's very cool, too. It's among my favorite. Now, there's a lot of different types of spiders. So which types do you like best? The Black Widow. The Black Widow. Good answer. Mm. That's another one of my favorites. I actually did a study in, co in college on the poisons that, that they and how it affects the human anatomy. So, so if you have friends right there, right, and you tell them you like the Black Widow, why do you tell them the Black Widow is so cool? Well, I mean, it can, like, it's... Hmm. I like it because I like the colors. Yeah, and beautiful design, huh? Because there's more than one of them, like... Sure. There's subspecies all over the place, right? And they're really kind of cool to be around. They're not dangerous or aggressive at all, are they? Yeah, because I saw them before. Yeah, you've I'm seen them. On a field trip. Wow, wow, very cool. And where do you live now? Are you in North Carolina? So, yeah. so you don't get too many black widows in North Carolina, do you? No, yeah, yeah. unless we take field trips. I see, yeah. In California, where I lived in Davis, there used to be dozens around my house and they never gave us any problems so well gentlemen i really appreciate your time I, and uh, of Thank course you. we're going to circle back around with the folks here but um if there's one thing about insects that you could share with the world what would you share they're not aggressive unless you make it aggressive that's a good answer how about you leonard um well the cockroach um it can last to like it can last longer than normal humans because it can last like like um if like a comet or something were to hit the earth, um, cockroaches could survive it. Oh yeah, they've already done that a few times, right? So that's why I do a whole lecture called Insects Run the Planet, Humans Are Only Along for the Ride. So for this edition, thank you to everybody in Cameroon and the United States. All right, bringing it home. We're gonna continue the buzz on the Beathon. Be right back. It is the afternoon on day three here at the ESA for the Beathon. We just enjoyed a lovely lunch and a lovely chat about bugs over lunch here. And I'm delighted to have on the Insect News Network for the first time uh, a couple, a mother-daughter duo here, that have a very, very special insight to insects. Uh, you know, inter intergenerational knowledge is very important, and I don't think I'm going to bump into another pair of women here at this event that are going to talk about things that are more cool. So Dina Smith and uh, the, this is a Sophia Nufio. Sophia Nufio. So Sophia, welcome to the Insect News Network. <laughs> <laughs> Dana, welcome. So um, the conversation started off because Dina is a professional entomologist of a very unique subspecies. She is uh, a friend. Well, how would you describe it? What is the exact title? Paleo entomologist. Paleo entomologist. Yeah. There we go. She studies the fossil records of insects and other invertebrates. Now this is a rarefied field. It's also one that's uh, loaded with controversy and significance because it sort of is constantly 
constantly changing and evolving and mm -hmm. new discoveries challenge the paradigms but if you ever saw the movie Jurassic Park it was firmly rooted in the work that she does that scene yes. where where <laughs> where they extracted the DNA from the mosquito that comes from a true life story because David Attenborough professor uh, sir David Attenborough um, he was given a, an amber insect as a young child by his sister and it began his fascination with the mm -hmm. amber collection so without me talking tell me a little bit about the crux of your work the crux of my work so I use insects in the fossil record to study ecology mm. and evolution so I'm I'm here at ESM I'm going to talk about the diversification of beetles ah, giving a fossil perspective there have been lots of new fossils uh -huh, and uh -huh. so we kind of can get a get a view of how they've evolved over time and and as we talked about earlier how some of the major mass extinction events are not really that major for <laughs> the bugs can handle the it insect world, especially uh, not beetles so oh yeah their, yeah their story is not is one of not going extinct yeah. low extinction yeah, which yeah. is really cool the point is, folks, is that the insects are on the planet, humans are only along for the ride. Yes. It's all of this, uh, <laughs> endothermic creatures suffer with the major climate change. It's all the insects that learn how to adapt. But but now, now of course, when you talk about the oldest insects, I thought it was the oldest uh, fossilized records were mayflies, but there's one that go back even further. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the some of the very earliest groups, very basic leaf litter dwelling insects are some of our earliest mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the fossil record. They're known from little mouth part fragments and wow, things amazing. like that. So over, you know, 400 million years old. Yeah, so yeah. And of course, since it, this is the Beathon, and we all know that uh, yep. the, the classic uh, Darwin expression about flowers being an abominable mystery uh, is concomitant with the rise of, of the honeybees and the other pollinators. And they go back, what, about 140 million years? That sound about right? I, yeah, some maybe even further Is than that, that right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. the honeybee is 140, but there's other bees that go back before Yeah, that. the Hymenoptera the group Hymenoptera in which the bees are within sure. go back earlier. But there's some evidence that the flowers have an earlier origin as oh, well. How about that? So the fossil, you know, there's kind of, um, you know, this uh, disconnect between sometimes what we see in the fossil record sure. and what we see in the modern phylogenetic oh, yeah, work. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's evolution is a constant evolution, yeah. you know, for sure. And now we're let's... always finding new things. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so, so this year, helps. so what is the coolest thing that you found this year? The coolest thing that I found this year, we found a stock-eyed fly. Oh, and these guys are great. And we're working on that They're to kooky. describe these it. Are, these are the flies with, like, the really long, like, yes. their eyes are at the end of really long, like, you know, yes. tubes yeah, sticking out of their head, you know. Now, um... The other thing uh, listeners should know is why this field is so important is because unlike other forms of life that have either a shell or uh, a skeleton, mm -hmm. insects are an extremely difficult fossil to find because mm -hmm. their bodies disintegrate. Isn't that right. the case? Well, and it turns out they... so. They actually have a really good fossil record. Oh, scratch that. Yeah. Yeah. Reverse that. <laughs> <laughs> Edit. It's, it's just knowing where to find yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. That's the trick. Yeah, you know, yeah. Being an expert. That's what yeah, it's yeah. all about. So, so let's, they, when oh, they're in the types of deposits where you find them, they're super diverse, super abundant, I super see. rich. So it's finding those. But it's always spots. a print, though. You don't actually find exoskeletons, correct? No. So there's actually, even in fossils 30, 40 million years old, there's some original chitin in some oh, of those wow, fossils crazy. still. Yeah, so chitin's actually pretty resilient to decay. Yeah. So all the soft tissues will decay and go away, but that hardened exoskeleton mm -hmm. is often what remains. And then sometimes wow. you get a carbon remains like okay. you find in and lake fossils. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And chitin, just for the viewing audience, is, is a blend of proteins and sugars, and it's what makes the exoskeleton, exoskeleton so special. Now, let's turn it the, to the younger generation yes. for a perspective on this fossilized record. Now, you tell me that you have been liking bugs your whole life. Is that the case? Um, yeah. Yeah. And and you have a, a special interest in a, an insect that most people don't understand. What were you telling me earlier? Well, um, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, your thopterans, very nice. And you grew up where? Uh, in Colorado. Okay, so you're 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 really a big fan of the eastern grasshoppers, or where do you live in Colorado? Um, we live in uh, Boulder. Boulder, yeah. very nice. So okay, that. so the foothills. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. So tell me about grasshoppers. What do you know about them? Well, they're um, animals, basically. They're insects that can fly. Mm -hmm. Well, some of them can just hop. Mm -hmm. And people think grasshoppers, they bite and they hurt because of their legs. But um, 
They just they just want to get away, and that's why they <laughs> kick you. Yeah, we do a lot more damage to them than they do to <laughs> us. And she was uh, smart enough to point out to me that they their mouth mouth parts don't have teeth, right? They don't actually have that type of mouth part. And all insects can be divided into about seven or eight different mouth part categories. But you have a sensitivity for another insect that gets a bum rap. We talked about cockroaches, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. And what do you, what do you say about cockroaches? I. Uh, you said I, sometimes you pick them up and pet them, right? Yeah. I I like petting their back because the, with the hissing cockroaches, they just hiss, and I let, I think it's cool. It's kind of funny, yeah, that. very cool. Yeah, and of course, as I discussed with mom, cockroaches are part of a huge category of creatures that are called dorso ventrally thigmotaxic, and that means they just like to be touched on two sides. Who doesn't, right? You know. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, when you, when you move that trash can and that cockroach goes scurrying around, for, it's not trying to attack you, it's That's trying right. to escape because it wants to wedge itself into places where its top and bottom can be touched. Centipedes, some spiders, there's all kinds of primitive insects. They just want to be left alone, folks. That's really the point. Now, what's cool about talking about the grasshopper, we're talking about, again, this is the Beathon 4 and more. And this is a topic that most Americans don't understand. Um, the, possibly the largest insect swarms in the history of the world were in the United States. And it wasn't 400 million years ago, and it wasn't 40 million years ago. It wasn't even a million years ago. It was about 200 years ago. Now, how this story doesn't get told. Do you want to, you want to share part of the story, what oh, you know? Go for it. Okay, go for cool. It, yeah. So the Rocky Mountain locust, right in your backwoods, was uh, perhaps the largest swarms of any insect in the world. Estimates have put some of them as high as 30 billion in a swarm. And uh, the Westerners came in, the people from Europe, the settlers came in and kind of worked their way across the Midwestern states and they brought agriculture. And within 30 years, folks, the Rocky Mountain locust was completely wiped out of the United States. Mm -hmm. You never hear about this. You hear about the passenger pigeon, you hear about the bison, but what? how come they didn't give any, any credit to this no, creature? No, I know. And what, what do you think, uh, as far as a, a paleo entomologist goes, how, how does that sort of, uh, a, that's like a catastrophe, right? That's right, like a right, dramatic right. catastrophe. We, we eliminated a species, it doesn't even exist anymore anywhere. How does that fit into this idea of the fossil record in evolution? Well, that's a great question. I, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the rate of change. Yeah. So, you know, we look at the we look at the climate change in the past and yeah. we go, oh, things adapt, things can yeah. move. But the pace at which humans are changing the environment or changing climates is really, really has a, a it outpaces the rate at which yeah. organisms can respond yeah, to those changes. Yeah, it's pretty changes. scary. Even so something as robust as, as this, this yeah. 30 billion swarm. You can imagine, it must have blocked out the entire Rocky yeah. Mountains for people, you know. Exactly. And you never hear about it in any of the, the, the Great West uh, documentaries yeah, or anything like yeah. that. It's just pretty amazing to me that it gets missed. So, this is Sophia, let's finish up with you. If you had a message to the camera to share with all of the, the young entomologists out there, you know, the kids who really like insects but none of their friends do, what would you say to them? Well, bugs, you shouldn't be afraid of them because they're just mini us, basically. They're mini people. How about that? <laughs> That's a pretty cool perspective, too. And before we go, let me just ask you, do you have a favorite bug? Um... I like a lot of bugs. I don't have a favorite. I think you said the grasshoppers tops of your list. Yeah. How about mom? What's your favorite bug? Beetles. For oh, sure. you're a beetle. I'm yeah. A beetle person. So many people here at the ESA are uh, beetle people. Is there one particular beetle? Mm, I really like weevils. Oh yeah, they're they're, so they're quirky, cool, aren't great. they? they are. Everyone, you should. They have, have everyone should have one. They do. They do, <laughs> and they're a big impact too. And they're really quite diverse. You know, even though their body structure is kind of same, really misunderstood because basically they just react to all the messes that we create as yes. as in agriculture. <laughs> You know. Well, listen, Miss Sophia, it was a pleasure. Thanks for being on the Beathon. Dina, it was a pleasure too. Yeah, nice and to uh, we'll, you. To, we'll, we'll keep in touch to see what more big discovery. I'll come to your talk tomorrow. Okay. How about okay. that? That'd be great. <laughs> we'll be back for more of the Beathon 4 in one minute. So this year's theme for the Beathon 4 and more was to use the paintbrush to ex paint the widest canvas possible of the human insect connection. And this week at the ESA, I have to say, it has been beetle mania. I've met more people in the beetles here than any other meeting so far. Any other bug group has been represented. And of course, there's a great reason why. It's because of the Coleopterus Society, one of the oldest and most esteemable groups of entophiles anywhere in the United States. And I'm here with Miss Victoria Bayless. Victoria, welcome to 
the Insect News Network. Thank you. And on the Beathon, you know, we we were we're profiling the human insect connection about honeybees and pollinators and other creatures. But mm -hmm. anybody who's into bugs knows the beetles kind of rule the world, right? Beetles, beetles rule the world. <laughs> Is they, that right? They if they if it can be done, beetles have figured out how to do it. That's a nice way to put it, right? And we're not mm -hmm. talking about the beetles, right? I mean, they were great, but they're you know they're done. The beetles that we're talking about have been around for what? 200 million years, 300 million years. years. So a yeah, long time. A long time. Now, how long has the society been here? Uh, in the early 50s or late 40s, early 50s. And how did the Coleopterus Society begin? Well, we started as mostly a place to to uh, publish a journal. Was the reason that we wanted to get together was so that all the people who are working on uh, beetles could. Uh, Publish someplace altogether, and so it just it was a scientific us. endeavor. It was a scientific yeah. endeavor, and it's mostly still a scientific endeavor. Oh, it's pretty social too, though. You <laughs> guys have a who, yeah. Right. We do. We have a good time. We had a nice, I had a nice connection with Max Barclay yes. from the London right. Natural History Museum, and I, I think probably in the world of entomology, between the butterflies and the beetles, that was kind of how entomology got started. It was some of the most pioneering mm -hmm. thinkers. Now there was one at the very beginning. Who was that guy? Uh, Charles. Uh, oh, Darwin. Charles Darwin. That's it. Charles. <laughs> Darwin was a big beetle he guy. Big beetle. Now, Victoria, tell I, me, what is your personal interest in beetles? Uh, well, I am the curator of the insect collection at LSU. Mark of all. So when go Tigers. We, yes. Go Beetles. Go, be go Tiger Beetles. <laughs> go the Tiger, tiger beetles, beetles of LSU. There we go. Uh, we had that on our T-shirt for a while. I love there. Tiger Beetles. Actually. They, oh, you did really? Yeah. Oh, they were marked. Well, let's circle back about Tiger Beetles, but I okay, interrupted you. Anyway, yes. You're curating the collection. I curate the collection, and so uh, my former boss, the director, and then the boss, the director now, both work on beetles. And so everybody in our department who has anything much to do with the museum, all the graduate students are all beetle people. And so all, you know, mm. you just can't. Our biggest room is the beetle room and so I spend most of my time curating beetles. Wow and I know now folks you understand how many different species of beetles there are. The, the statistic that's thrown out is 80% of all insects are beetles. Mm -hmm. uh, they carry their homes on their backs and they have their ultimate architects and designers. The, the number the, the amount of variety that you get within that basic body design is absolutely mind-blowing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. And since most insects and beetles are small and people don't actually get to see what they look like. They're so used to looking at the, the big beetle structure with, you know, that's easy to see. Sure. But when you get down into the, some of this really tiny stuff, like in the pictures we have back here, you know, these are beetles, you know, these things that look like a flea and, yeah. a, you know, something like that. Those are all just beetles. Fairy, fairy beetles. Isn't there a fairy beetle or the tiniest little beetle oh, in the world? The, uh, yeah. I think it's called fairy beetle. Uh, you can call them anything you want. Common say. names. You, it's a, you can... Let it rip, folks. <laughs> I never remember the scientific names anyways. Now, right. so let's circle back around. I'm glad you brought this up, that uh, the tiger beetle is one of my favorite creatures on the planet. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody watching, you can look right up the link right above the video here and vote for your bug of the year. Um, we're taking nominations right now during the ESA, yeah. and then by the time this broadcast, people will actually have voted on the bug of the year. Um, and so last year, our top 25 nominees, one of them was the salt marsh tiger beetle. Mm -hmm. So just for the listeners, so they can put it into perspective, how cool are tiger beetles? Oh, tiger beetles are cool at the 1 through 10. They're a 12. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe a 20. Yeah. Maybe a 20. And tell them why they're so cool. Well, they're, you know, they're predators, for one thing, and I particularly like predators. They just are, they're fast. I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most guys <laughs> like bugs because they eat other things, things right? <laughs> and everything. And they have these larvae that live in little tunnels underground, mm -hmm. and they stay underneath and wait till they, things come along and reach out oh, and snatch yeah. them. They're, and they're predators from the beginning to the end. But they they're, are. They're, they're, the remarkable feature about tiger beetles is how aggressive they are and how fast they are. They are Isn't so fast. Yeah. They're so hard to catch. They, they, they sometimes can sprint at speeds of uh, something around a meter per second when they're on their the top of their their game which is faster than Michael Johnson the uh, the so Olympic sprinter special. yeah yeah so if if there's a message that you wanted to portray now obviously when you get around other beetle geeks it's easy yeah, to it's talk easy. about how cool beetles are mm -hmm. but when somebody comes up like spiders mosquitoes cockroaches bed bugs these kind of creatures, you know, everybody has a, the right reason to be, you know, to, to love to their aversion, own right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, aversion. Uh, an aversion, so. right? People, like the general public <laughs> yes. has an aversion to those. But then you talk honeybees and ladybugs and butterflies, mm -hmm. and people like, I love them. Uh -huh. With beetles, it's really, it's such a huge group of organisms. Some sure. of them are the biggest agricultural pests in the world. Some of them are the most fascinating, weird, niche-filled, uh, you know, niche of, fillers in the world. And a lot of big beneficials that, you know, sure, the lady sure. beetles are just fabulous beneficials. Yeah, the lady beetle so. alone is 
uh, mm -hmm. uh, loved around the world. I say every little kid learns to count on a ladybug. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the name behind the ladybug, do you know the history of that name? I do not. It's a lovely story. It's, as a cultural entomologist, it's one of my favorites. It was uh, a medieval name, and it came from uh, the peasants in England. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to see, whenever they had verdant crops, they would notice this beautiful little beetle was very, very prevalent and so they named it after uh, Jesus' mother, our, our, our mother, the lady. Bird, oh, the that's ladybug, a, that's a very the lady nice beetle. Story. It's a lovely one. And, the, and the, the names in Russia, in Ireland, and parts of Eastern Europe, they all, even the translated names, they all translate into like God's cow or, or the or mother's cool. watchkeeper and things like that. Really lovely stuff, you know. Right, so. except the fact that they're like really vicious little predators. Right, right. That, <laughs> yeah. like, oh. If you've ever seen them impale an aphid, and, <laughs> really like, you know, stick it up in the air. It's, but we, we, we're glad they are because yeah. if without the ladybugs, our we're, rose bushes and our, would be decimated, right? So, so um, what's the message you would send out about beetles? Well, you know, it's, it, it gets kind of mixed up with the message you send about insects in general, is yeah. that they're such an important part of the overall environment, of overall health of our world, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, because there are more beetles than anything else, so it just sort of fits into that category sure. of not not categorizing all insects as evil or bad or pre or pests or something. That's the most important thing that we do. They're just, they're everywhere. Yeah. And There's they're... as many pluses and minuses with insects as there are pluses and minuses with people. That's, That's the point, right. right? Now, one last question, since this is the be -a we're talking about pollinators. Oh, okay. There's some major pollinators that are beetles too, aren't there? There are, yeah. there are. Uh, I don't happen to work on any or know any particular ones, but well, I know, know that they're out, I mean, they're, they, like I said, if they can do it, if it can be done, they'll do it. They're out there pollinating. They have all kinds of structures. They walk all over plants. They're, they're an important part they're of They're doing each. the deal. They're yeah. doing the thing. Well, listen, Victoria, I'm so glad you were my last interview here Thank at you. ESA yes. 2014, and to all you bug people out there, become a beetle person, too. That's right. And we Join have, the Coleopter Society. We have our own society. Yeah. How about that? I can't imagine what the dinner parties sound like. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Remarkable. So, everybody, keep the buzz going. Uh, we'll be back for more of uh, uh, to be a thon 2014.